up next we have Mike and Mariella, Mike Dunn and Mariella Marzano from, um, they are both social scientists at Forest Research. Um, their work focuses on understanding human attitudes and behaviour related particularly to species management, tree and plant biosecurity and stakeholder engagement. Um, some of you may have met Ma uh, Mike and Mariella as they've been undertaking interviews and surveys throughout the Red Schools United project um, and they're going to share with us some of the results now. God, it's tough. Hi, everybody. Thank you for talking nicely about my mother's dog. <laughs> I, I'm also half Italian, and I'm going to forgive you with the Scottish results. <laughs> I'm be looking a bit angry, I'll be thinking dark thoughts about France at 1645, but anyway, not so well. Right, so, we know a lot of you. We've been standing here for the last four years um, talking about various bits that we've been doing at the part of the RSU project. Um, and it was, we were trying to think about what we wanted to talk about. We've got some new stuff to present. We've just done another survey. But I thought I'd do a little, um, although Callum has rather stolen my thunder and done it rather more beautifully, but um, I thought I'd talk a little bit more about, or just give a, a brief overview of some of the work that we've done in the past, just to remind you, and to remind you that you're all rather fabulous. And thank you, for sp not only for doing all the work you've done for RSU, but you know, putting up with us a lot, turning up and asking you endless questions or hanging out with you and, you know, possibly fainting at the sight of the first squirrel being killed and, you know, various other things. So what did we do? We did um, interviews with you guys right at the, sort of very early on in sort of 2017. The project started 2016. We talked to landowners. We did lots of work with the RSU team members, chatting through them before and sort of towards the end of the project about what it is they wanted to get, because it was quite vague what we were supposed to be doing as social scientists. I think it was quite innovative to have social scientists and, and modelers like um, Eileen involved in these projects. And what I want to also say before I forget is, you know, you know all this stuff. You've been, you know, you are volunteers yourself. You've been working with volunteers. And what we really need is to start writing this stuff up. And... Our sample sizes may not be big, it's, just, it's based on what we could do with the time that we had, but if we joined our sample sizes and we wrote this stuff up, we could make much more impact on policy, I think, by having this stuff published. So it's a call, really, to say, let's gather together and write this, write this stuff up and get it published so that it has mo more weight. Um, we've also done some evidence review groups, I don't really need to go into that, getting a bunch of people together to talk about some issues, and we've been really quite successful in, in publishing some of that stuff. And, you know, we, we've done two surveys, so we did a nationwide survey of the general public in 2015 when we were in the HLF development phase, and you were I was given six weeks to get this off the ground. And because of that short space of time, we decided to do an online panel survey. So I, I've learned a lot of lessons working <laughs> with you guys over the four years, because I didn't know in your, your areas that nobody lived there and certainly nobody that was going to take part in an online panel so as as the survey got on and we got less and less numbers in the all these in the Merseyside and the north in the Cahilda area our postcodes were getting wider and wider and wider until we covered you know most of Northern Ireland and most of Merseyside so this time um, and Mike's going to present the results we decided to just focus on telephone interviews this time and you know the smaller areas so this, it, it's not directly comparable but there's some some similarities that we can we can talk about and again it's a nice it's a nice survey number so um, when we talked to the teams at the very beginning we were trying to assess what questions do you want answered what do you want us to do because you know you can put things in, in in proposals all the time but actually our job is to do stuff for you guys whatever it is you want us to look at what do you want us to explore and these were some of the questions um, has awareness of um, Red Squirrels United increase. We needed to find out about that. Has let's switch it around though. Let's not worry about that. Has awareness of RSU increased during the lifetime project? Has the biggest scale of Red Squirrels United improved efforts to engage with communities and volunteers? More importantly, has awareness of red squirrels and impacts of grey squirrels increased? How do we motivate volunteers to participate in, in activities? And all these sorts of questions about motivations of the volunteers and how do we do this? I mean, it was such a big scale project, such an ambitious project. You know, some of the questions the team were thinking was, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to join up across these, these wide areas? And I'm sad that that's not actually going to be taken forward, because I agree with Callum, this should be this 
sort of volunteer hub to which we all connect and collaborate because then we can really, really have much more force. And also, you know, how do we think about the sustainability of um, voluntary groups? It's my first life project and it, it's, it's really quite interesting to think about that sustainability because we're so used to being in those three-year cycles where we move on to the next project and move on to the next thing. And I quite like the idea of thinking about, well, how do we make this work more in the future and how do we keep it going? How do we improve cooperation with landowners and agencies, you know, with that high turnover or, you know, getting that access? And then we know that's been quite an issue. And which activities and engagement efforts have had the most success? And I won't, I won't cover that today. Um, I am rather anxious to make sure that we finish on time. So, just to recap, um, these are the questions. Do you remember ages ago we turned up sheepish with our little dictaphones and tried to join your meetings and asked you these questions? There's some nods in there. So, we want to know, what is it? that makes you tick? Why do you volunteer for red squirrel conservation? You know, what are the challenges that you face and how can we get those lessons learned and apply them in the future? And we've written, um, I should say, we've written three reports, four reports, oh, endless reporting. Um, and they're online, aren't they? So they're just brief summaries. Um, we've got the first um, survey published as well in Biological Conservation, but I'm happy to share this with you and anything that we've done. All we've done gazillions of presentations and stuff, so any of this stuff that you really like to see, we, we'd be happy to share with it. But, you know, the, the summaries of these are in... Um, in those reports, and you know this stuff, you know, what is it that motivates people to volunteer? And what makes, motivates people to volunteer for, for squirrels? And it's that, you know, that link to your childhood, that strong desire. So how, what can we tap into? What are these, these existing motivations that we can tap into? And can we then expand that further? Again, Callum has, has talked a lot bit about, but have you researched volunteers? That's what I'm interested in. Have you talked to them about their motivations? And have you got all this data? in relation to... I'm always gathering data, sorry. So it's just thinking about how do, we, how do we gather all this information together? And we've got some lovely quotes from people about why they do it. And also what they feel about grey squirrels. So what is the motivation to, to, to do something about the grey squirrels? Well, we don't really like them very much. They're bullies, they're tree rats, they're greedy, they're boring. We got into trouble for talking about this in the mammal society, didn't we? Because apparently that's really negative language, that's what you said. So we had to... Uh, stand next to it but there's also the social aspects so how do we build those social aspects it's not just about your love of wildlife I would be interested in your opinion so I hope we get some some feedback if not any questions but it's that working with like-minded people feeling that you're part of a community um, that physical and mental health and well-being that greater knowledge that training keeping our brains working you know that education the feedback that we're getting that we're making a difference all these these are important and we fed that back to the teams right at the beginning of the project and what are your challenges again you know this stuff okay majority of volunteers retirees and i was doing stuff on bird watching years ago and it's the same sort of thing you're comp you know squirrels are competing with other conservation objectives which is why callum's idea of a knowledge of a volunteer sort of knowledge hub is as, as important really because we've got many interests we're not just in, interested in one species we we like conservation we've got loads but we've only got so much time so how do we weigh up those competing objectives and it's not about making sure squirrels win it's about how do, we, how do we balance that? The lack of funding, the training opportunities, the difficulties of landscape scale collaboration that can impede access and frustrate eradication. And that fear of public backlash, that lack of support from conservation landowners, you know, and it could be perceived, it could be real, but that really does affect you. And, and you, you are brave and you are courageous and you're going out there and you're doing it, whether it's socially acceptable to others or not. And that has to be, that has to be um, applauded. What was really interesting about this landscape scale collaboration issue and, the, and potential issues with landowners, and that can be public bodies as well as private landowners, we then got the message that we should probably try to talk to some of these landowners about what their motivations were. And we, we looked at a range of different, we tried to sample it such that there were different types of um, private, uh, private and public landowners, different types of land, different types of access issues. And what were their motivations? So, you know, we start, we always start off positive. So what is it that you like 
about this. Why do you participate? Well, one, do you participate? I've left that side up because we haven't got time. But two, what is it that would make you participate or collaborate? And it's, it was what we found the motivations were this a native species, but it also brings a lot of benefit to the local community. It's that public enjoyment. It's that economic benefit. It's that pride in having those red squirrels. We're proud to have them here, they were saying. They don't like greys because they damage trees, don't they? And there, there was also the sense that they were damaging the wider environment. They, they're impacting on other species. So, you know, we really don't like them. So, we, you know, we then stand back. Okay, you've talked about the benefits. You've talked about um, the negative aspects and motivations. What are the barriers? Well, these are what were coming up. We're worried, really, about trespassing and damage. We, we feel that we can't, might not be able to control who comes onto our land, and that's why we're a little bit anxious. We've got this health and safety concerns. Have you got insurance before you come on my land? What if you shoot somebody that's walking past? Or, you know, we've got visitors' acts and these These are all the concerns that are going through people's heads. And if we don't talk about it, or we don't talk it through, um, they don't get resolved. Um, again, that fear of opposition. So what if I'm a public body with lots of visitor access and I'm seen to be killing one fluffy species that some people might, we perceive that those people might like for another fluffy species. How do we deal with that? I'm not sure I want it. I'm a bit wary about that. We had the apathetic and the lack of awareness. We, you know, what is the benefit to me? If it's no benefit to me, why the hell do I want to do it? So we didn't have many of them, but we did have some that said, you know, it's, it's of no, no big deal to me. Um, the time and the resources, the perception of hopelessness. So you talked a lot about islands. I've learned a lot about the ecology over the last four years. But you do get that sense of there's so many of them. And then you, you create this vacuum and more are coming. And is it endless? And are we ever going to get on top of this? I just put my hands up. I've got other things to deal with. So that sense of hopelessness. And then conflicts with other objectives. I learned about this, I think, in Merseyside, that, you know, conifers and red squirrels and other land management conservation objectives sometimes clash. So there are, there are those, those issues. And these are all, we've got lots and lots and lots of quotes like this. So then we had to think about, okay, how do we incentivize those engagements? And Callum brought this is people like to conform to social norms. So if your land, your neighbours are doing something and you're not, that can look bad for you in terms of your status and your prestige amongst your, your peers. And so it's making sure that landowners know what others are doing and how important it is in terms of tapping into that social norm. There's lots of behavioural theories which no need to go into it today, that you can think about how you tap into those social norms. And there's things like called perceived behavioural control, which you have to make people feel that they can do something about it and it's going to actually make a difference. We know about the financial incentives, but also that great an awareness, you know, uh, hammering home that fact that grey squirrels actually impact you in this particular way. And if you actually joined us, those impacts would increase. Not, you know... Um, emphasize the resources that's going to be required for you to participate, but what the benefits are of you participating in squirrel control. And then there's this whole thing, I think you mentioned it as well, Callum, about this trust. I think Esther did as well, trust in, in ranges of volunteers. So you need to have that insurance. You need to be part of a trusted group. You need to have that brand. You need to be formed. So I, it's, it's really nice to hear about, well, they were already well-established groups, and you've been sharing the lessons learned, you know, from your um, groups uh, in the past going forward for the, for the new groups and the uh, newly motivated groups. But it's having that, um, being a trusted source, having that good communication, that good feedback, so instilling that trust so that that landowner is building that relationship and you are the group that can come onto that person's land. And new approaches, okay? They're like, oh, okay, contraception, pine martyrs, I like the idea of this. This might, might take away some of the burden from me. So it's feeding back to the landers what the latest research is on that, what the latest um, views are on that. So I think we've talked about this um, before, but I wanted to bring it up again and just to thank you for all your patience and your engagement with us over the last four, four years. It's been absolutely brilliant. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I think, Mike... So what we wanted to do was just to give you a bit of feedback on the latest survey we've done. Shall I just... I'll sit down. Yeah, so momentum, uh, this is a word that I heard mentioned over breakfast this morning, uh, all of the work we've done in the RSU delivery areas collectively over the course of the project. Uh, and Marielle has talked about some of the research we've done involving interviews and, and workshops, that kind of thing. With the survey data, we have a chance to quantify some of the progress and, and momentum that, 
that we've got in these areas. So because we have these two data sets, we have that survey, the nationwide survey at the beginning of the project, and then we have a more targeted survey in the RSU delivery areas, the more recent one. And because these surveys contained some shared questions, we're able to make these comparisons. So things like how do levels of knowledge and values differ between those in the red squirrel areas and the wider population? How does the knowledge and acceptability of controls differ between those two populations? And drawing specifically on the, on the latest survey data just in the RSU delivery areas, you know, to what extent are people in these communities involved in squirrel management? So just a quick look at the, the sample characteristics there from the, the two samples. Mariella went into this, the difficulty we had in trying to get a good response uh, rate from, from the, the remote areas, the RSU areas. Uh, that, so even though that was a, a sample of nearly 4,000 people, we did struggle a little bit there in the RSU areas. The 2009 survey is just responses from the RSU areas, so we had quarters for each of the delivery areas uh, that we managed to meet, and in total that was 1,000 respondents. And pretty good breakdown in both surveys, uh, good representation across the different age brackets and genders. So let's take a quick look at knowledge. Two maps here showing um, the responses to, to whether people um, were aware of a relationship between red and grey populations. Essentially, whether they were aware grey populations would impact red populations. Uh, and we see a, a range of, of scores there from the reds knowing nothing about this relationship through to the, the dark green knowing a lot. So the map on the left is the nationwide sample. And you see it's quite a mixed bag there. And then the more recent survey on the right focusing in the RSU delivery areas, a lot more green, good high awareness there. We also had a couple of questions in there. Um, well, a, a combination of, of statements where people would be presented with um, reds are, are threatened uh, and greys are threatened, or reds are thriving and greys are threatened, these kind of things. And, and nearly nine out of ten people here correctly noted that red squirrels are threatened while grey squirrels are thriving, and, and similarly correctly noted that red squirrels are native while grey squirrels are an invasive alien species. So because of we didn't have the, that baseline data in the, the RSU areas, we cannot say that the RSU project is completely responsible for, for this high awareness, but what we can say with some degree of certainty is that where you guys are, are out on the ground, doing the communication, outreach, getting the newsletters out, these kind of things, we have very good awareness of, of the situation in the RSU delivery areas. Moving on to think about values, so again, the comparison between the RSU areas and the, the wider population, those in the, the red squirrel areas uh, perceive red squirrels to have a positive impact uh, on the economy and, and on society in general, more so than the wider population. And there's also greater agreement in those red squirrel areas for things like forest and woodland managers needing to undertake management, which the wider public might not agree with. So, for example, that could be grey squirrel control. Whereas the wider population, they were more likely to agree that it's important to conserve both red and grey squirrels. So we can see some clear differences here in the way these two different populations value red and grey squirrels. And similarly here, this one was um, asking people their level of agreement or disagreement about um, the desirability of seeing red and grey squirrels in different settings. So the red bars there are from the, the RSU delivery areas where we've got the reds and the blue are the responses from the nationwide survey. So focusing on the left first, the desire to see red squirrels in those different settings. You can see across the board, quite high agreement. People want to see them in those different settings. Whereas the figure on the, the right there, the desire to see greys, you can see it's markedly higher, the desirability in the nationwide survey. So again, different values in these two different populations. When we think about acceptability of controls, we asked about seven different controls there. I know not all of these are, are feasible, um, but I think some of the takeaways here are that the respective acceptability in the two populations for the, for the controls is the same. We see that the non-lethal methods down the bottom there tend to be the most acceptable. Um, of the lethal controls, Pine Martin is the most acceptable, but the other thing you'll notice is that for any one of these controls, the acceptability is higher in the areas uh, where you guys have been working, the RSU delivery areas. So in terms of awareness of squirrel management, whether that be either per kind of 
communicated as grey scroll control or red scroll conservation, 53% of the people in the RSU areas were aware of coordinated controls in comparison with just 11% in the wider population. Again, we kind of put this down entirely to, to the RSU project because in some of these wider population areas that control just might not be happening. But if we look at um, the awareness of who's undertaking the squirrel management in the, diff in the different RSU areas, we see that, that 45% uh, recognised that this was coming from RSU and then we have another bunch from the Wildlife Trust, Red Squirrels Trust Wales, so some of the partners of, of Red Squirrels United. So that's just really, a, I think, about a reflection of how communication and outreach is badged. In terms of community involvement, we found in the, in the Red School United area, so this is just the, the latest survey data, that around 11% of people said that they already assist in some way with squirrel management. But I think the interesting one here is that yellow slice there, saying that 47% uh, of people are interested in assisting, but don't do so at present. Now, whether all of these people would do what they say they would in, in a survey is, is one thing, but I, I think that's, that's quite a big chunk, and I think this shows there is some potential there that there's an opportunity to, to perhaps get some more of these people involved. We've touched on these kind of things in, in previous presentations, barriers to involvement. Time is the big one. Who doesn't need more time? But there's also a perceived lack of skills and um, not knowing how to get involved. So these are things that, that we really can do something about an interesting takeaway here is things such as uh, disagreement with the idea of squirrel control or disagreement about the, um, the methods used in squirrel control. We're talking three or four percent in these red squirrel areas. So some of the things that we might think are, are, are barriers to involvement, they're, they're really quite low in these areas. Similarly, we've talked about motivations before. So we, I've mentioned the value of red squirrels to these people, but also, the, the mental and, and physical benefits are, are key motivators for people. We can quantify that, I think, 35%. And also, um, an opportunity for social interaction, 24%. So I think these are things that we need to bear in mind when we're thinking about who we target and, and how we frame those messages. And this is just a, a quick summary of the, the level of interest in a variety of different roles. So some of the things that, that are perhaps seen as, as more pleasurable, the monitoring, the hosting of, of filling feeders tend to be up the top. These are also things that are, don't require a lot of resources, uh, physical resources or, or skills necessarily, whereas some of the others down the bottom, the grey scroll control or hosting meetings, these kind of things, you, you do need certain thing, prerequisites I think, to be able to do those. But our work in the communities has found that, that a lot of these roles aren't really recognised by the wider community. They're not really aware that there's this whole range of things they could be doing. Uh, and not all of these necessarily take up a, a huge amount of time. So I think that's something we need to communicate as well. Okay, to you, Maria. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, next. I'm only doing this one because um, I've just done the, an the analysis for it. God almighty, this is going to fall. Um, so... I just wanted to put this in. One I'm really interested, did anyone get called as part of our survey? So all those, st all right, so all those survey results are, are basically the wider community around you. So that's really interesting. Um, is what have the team learned? So we talked to the team members um, who have worked solidly for four years to try and build um, volunteer, volunteer groups or to help maintain the volunteer groups um, in each of these areas. What have they learned in, in terms of the opportunities and success and the challenges? And I think they're very similar to what all of you will be feeling, I think. And I'd be interested to get some feedback on that. We asked them what their opportunities and their successes were. So one of the things I'm really interested in is that there's been a huge range of activities. And although you might not be able to relate, or many people might not be able to relate um, some of their Red Squirrel awareness to Red Squirrels United, we only need that just for the funders, really. It's about raising awareness of red squirrel conservation. There's a lot of, are you the man or woman I tell about red squirrel? So there is that awareness that's, that's building in these areas through, through this collective effort, and I really do hope it continues. They found it really um, helpful for that knowledge sharing between the different groups and the different communities, and we heard a little bit about that this morning. Um, but more of that could have happened. So I think there's a lesson learned about how do you get more collaboration between different groups. We're all time poor, but 
the benefits of that have been really massive for the people that have been able to take part in that. And it also helps you to think beyond, you think about the bigger picture, beyond your, your own area, to show that the impact that you're actually having on uh, numbers more broadly across the UK. And found that the knowledge fit, this knowledge fit has been really, really good for that. But actually, could there be more be done? I'd be really interested in your opinions. And what have the challenges been? Well, yep, this is the penultimate slide. So uh, changes in goals. So we thought we had grey squirrels, and we haven't got grey squirrels. Or we thought we had red squirrels, and we haven't got red squirrels. We had to change tack. Um, and there are concerns, which I, again, I would be interested in your perspectives on that knowledge exchange and that sustainability of volunteer groups beyond this particular project or other projects, do you feel that there is a sustainability? What support in the sort of final, final stages of RSU or any other projects do you think you need to be able to keep going after these, these sort of projects end? And I'll, I'll leave it there because I think it's really important to think about what is the glue that holds you, get, holds you together and, and what do you need what support do you need for that? Again, going back to Callum's idea of this sort of volunteer hub, but how would you make it work and who would be in charge and how would you fund it? So thinking through some of these, these sorts of issues. But seeing as we're short of time, I'll just... Yeah, I'll just finish with a, a quick couple of points. I won't go through all of these, but, but just to say that uh, in these areas where, where you guys are working, the Red Schools United team has, has been deployed over the, the last four years, that so you do tend to have higher support, higher values for Red Squirrel. Uh, and more acceptance for these conservation methods or, or control methods. Um, so important to, to kind of not shy away from that and, and get that message out there. Um, we've talked about the acceptability of different methods. Some of the, the methods that are most relied upon aren't necessarily the most acceptable, but I think the teams have been quite open to new ideas, developing things like the, the Kenya trap and deploying that, looking at Pine Martin, uh, and I think Heinz mentioned looking at fertility control going forward. So that's very positive. Seeing that growth in, in volunteers, and we've tried to kind of feed back to the teams what you guys have been telling us in terms of the need for provision of training and information, even the, the organizing of, of knowledge fairs, this kind of thing. And I've mentioned the, the framing of, of benefits to attract more volunteers. We have a, a session on access and new audiences uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, and finally, uh, Nikki mentioned the, the economic benefits we've seen through this project. And, and through our work, we've been able to, to kind of provide this evidence base for high valuing of squirrels, like a greater awareness. And we hope that that's a platform that you can build upon and, and perhaps approach uh, other people. Heinz had a, a good, diverse uh, selection of, of supporters there. So hopefully, we can, we can find that in other areas as well, the likes of local authorities and businesses. And again, I think there's a, a session on funding as well later on in the program. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.